Poole is a fucking crazy. He, he's a crazy ass motherfucker. When I was over at Poole one time, he was doing like he was doing like a you fashion show. Him? I was with him. He had like fucking 15, 20 fucking girls with him, models, Jesus right? Christ. And Poole had this fucking Lamborghini dealership in this fucking hotel. This is a true story, guys. <laughs> I just left that all of a sudden. I well, go to this uh, fashion show. God, all these girls just sitting there, beautiful fucking models, Russian models. I'm like, God damn. It's like you thought you was at this fucking mafia convention. <laughs> Everybody's out there. Wow, it probably was actually. <laughs> <he's there. laughs> All right, guys, welcome back to Growth Minds. We've got the five-time NBA champ today on Dennis Rodman. Thanks for making the time to come on. How you doing? <clears throat> doing well. Doing well. Um, so. Really appreciate you coming on. I just want to comment uh, on your on your scarf. You got the unique hat on. This is something that you've always had going on, though, right? Throughout the NBA, you've always been someone that's dressed uniquely versus everyone else. Well, it's called dress for the occasion. <laughs> the rain, the cold. You know, you came here from Vancouver, didn't you? Yeah. You, you should know yeah, about the yeah. scarves and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah, the Vancouver. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> so it's pretty much. I pretty much don't wear anything too thick. Because it's always sunny here. Yeah, yeah. And this is something you've always done. You've known, you've been known for your fashion sense. Because right. a lot of people back then, <laughs> they weren't dressed in this like vibrant, kind of uniquely different manner. Now everybody's doing it. Everyone seems to be copying what you're, you've been kind of carrying on since, since when you were playing. Well, it's been, it's been a trend. It's, it's always been a Who else has been a trendsetter probably back in the 70s and 80s and pretty much, it's pretty much came back. Yeah, you know, three sixty right now. Like most clothes, most uh, like movies and everything is like that. So, I think everyone um, that's in the so what fashion sense, you know, athletes, you know, entertainers, you know, they all trying to be fashion cord and coronized and stuff like that. So, but yeah, I was just doing it just because it was just fun. Mm. You, know, you know, if you look back in the sixties, seventies, and even the eighties. I mean, that, that, that fashion, that fashion uh, mm, decade was really, really cool. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty much whatever you got in your car, just put it on. <laughs> just put it on, it looks good. And But now people are trying to be more like, you know, Art Deco-ish, you know, trying to be all like, okay, I wear, I wear yellow with blue or blue with pink yeah. or something like that and think that shit looks good, but it don't really look good, but it's more like what your eyes see, you know, these days. So yeah. it, everyone wants to be different. Yeah, they almost feels like they're trying too hard to be different just yeah. so that they can be different. They're trying to be hard to be different. And I think that people don't realize that no one is really uh, are authentic anymore. You right. Know? So I think that uh, if you look at people that set the trend, trend set of, you know, back in the day, now they're still living. It's pretty much what, what it is right now. So, I mean, if you look at Lady Gaga or you look at um, the, the girl in Vegas or, or, or even Beyonce, who... Who actually started this whole train with the girls? Madonna. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Madonna. <laughs> she started the whole train. Yeah. And uh, now all of a sudden now people are trying to really reach out there and to the stratosphere and try to outdo what she's trying to become and try to and try to have this new fashion sense. Yeah. Which is, it's which it's not a real new fashion sense. Gotcha. Well, we'll get back to Madonna for sure. Oh, back well, in this podcast, so well, you know we gotta. I want to bring her. <laughs> you so, brought her up first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, this is something that's been natural to you. I mean, you were really one of the first trendsetters in the NBA. You were. This is what you. One of the main things that you were known for, which is being uniquely different. How do you think that came to be? Is that just something that naturally came to you? Has this been like a mastermind strategy to be able to be uniquely different and dress different when no one else was? Well, you know, when you first come in the NBA, when you're very green behind the ears, you really don't know what t what type of um, dress code that is really necessary to be to fit in. Yeah. You know, um, I think it was mid '80s. I was dressing in polo, really nerdy, gayish, whatever. I always wouldn't look at that. You know, polo shoes, polo socks, polo shirt, and uh, I think as uh, years progress. I think I think the 1993 era year when I started to really just just go pretty much out the box. Yeah. Um, I really didn't copy anybody. I just think the fact that it's just one of those things where I just didn't really care about anything, and things started to just set in when I started to get into the. Uh, I started to really live in the in the gay community, and I started to get into what their their mindset was as mm -hmm. far as like vision. 
they didn't care about what people said about them. They didn't care what people thought. They didn't care what people, um, if they have any type of indecision, what, what they are and stuff like that. So basically I was hanging around, hanging out with those with with, uh, with with the gay community and uh, it taught me a lot being around being around the neighborhood huh. at the, back in San Antonio and LA and um, and um, so it was more where that's when Madonna popped in when she we started dating in 1983 94 yeah and um, a lot of people thought that she was a very big influence of you know, my lifestyle you know the way you I was dressing, think- the tattoos, the piercings, the color, the, the, the makeup, the, the, the you know, the, you know, just trying to be a trendsetter. Mm. But I think what you, at least I've hear some of the interviews that you've done, this is something you've kind of been influenced since you were a child. You talk a lot about how you were hanging around with your sister a lot, <laughs> and this is something that. Look at that thirty you, for thirty, huh? Thirty for thirty. Thirty for thirty. I yeah, yeah. That, right? Well, not even just yeah. that. You, I know I've heard some other interviews as well. You're talking right. about that as well. So talk to us a little bit about how that may have influenced the way you think, the way you dress, the way you've kind of expressed yourself. Well, a lot of people don't really realize the fact that when you're young, especially when you really don't have any type of direction, but your mind will give you the the, the uh, atmosphere to think out the box, because you never seen it. You know, you never wore it. You never you were felt anything that what you see on TV. And for me, it was more like, <clears throat> there was really no sense of direction or any type of fashion, any type of ideals, any type of direction as far as like job, you know, transportation, activities, sports, you know, career, athletes, anything. It was just more like just go on the projects and kick rocks and play whatever ball that you have in your hand, you know, yeah, stick ball. But I just think that uh, back in the day when I was basically with my sisters, there was no male figures. They used to dress me up all the time, and I, I pretty much liked it for some reason. You know, I didn't know, you know, being 12, 13 years old, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. You know, so it's pretty much you just try to fit in. Yeah. And uh, I was just pretty much, um, I was pretty much an um, introvert type of individual back then. Uh, like I said, you want to say I didn't have no sense of direction? who I was as far as as a human being, male or female. And I think if you saw the 30 for 30 or in some of the type of interviews that you hear me talk about, that, uh, yeah, I had those uh, curiosities about, you know, dressing up in women's clothes, dressing up in drag. Would you say your sister has been this role model for you, given that you spent so much time with her when you were a child? I I just think that just girls in general. Girls in general, I think that I looked at... I looked at girls more, more as a. It's gonna kind of, kind of, kind of sound weird. I think I look at girls more as a father figure. Mm. <laughs> Pretty much, you never heard that before, have you? No, I, I, looked at, I looked at girls as a father figure because everywhere my sister went, I went with with them. And I thought they was pretty much like the the head, of the, the leader of the pack. Right. And whatever they did, I thought it was cool what they was doing because I didn't have no sense of direction. So if they wanted to jump off a building, I probably did the same damn thing. Damn. If they wanted to go, uh, you know, get indulged in sex, I think I probably would have dived in with them. So it's okay, great. Whatever they did, I was doing. Wow. So uh, I didn't have, no, it, it was no male figure in my life um, um, back in the late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s. So I was pretty much uh, in that um, mix of trying to figure out who I was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, in, in many sense, I guess we still all are. At, w- at what point, you know, you were 13 or 14 where you were hanging around a lot with your sister. At what point did that kind of start to shift where uh, you perhaps had a male figure or you had some male friends and they started to probably put these like societal pressures on you where like, that's not cool. Like you shouldn't dress like a girl, all that kind of stuff that we've been forced upon. Right. Yeah, it was it was weird. I mean, I don't really talk about it too much, but I think my uncle or cousins used to tell me, "Man, why are you hanging with these girls all the time? Why are you why are you such a little bitch and faggot?" And they just called me all these names. I didn't know what the fuck that was. Yeah, <laughs> you know, what faggot and bitch was. I thought it was more like you didn't okay, know what great. that was. I didn't know what it, what, what it meant. Yeah, <laughs> so it's yeah. more like okay, so great, like, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so uh, I just think that I think one day. Uh, I think my cousin um, got me uh, got, grabbed me one day and said, "You know what? 
Uh, we're going to make you fight these uh, two guys and see what counts if you're a man or you're a girl. And uh, they used to take me out there on the weekends and try to make me fight guys. Your uncle did. Yeah, my uncle did and stuff wow. like that. And wow. I just really didn't realize what he was trying to do, but it's more like I never would fight anybody. And they would do that every week, every week until I started, until I started to fight back. And, um, and they said, I guess you're not, you know, feminine. But mm. uh, they knew that I was, I was pretty much more like as there was something missing in my life as far as a male figure. Because I'm hanging around with women so much. I'm not yeah. hanging around with males. So I guess my uncle figured that, you know, he wanted to pr show me, that, you know, between what's a man and what's a female. Yeah. So what's a man and a woman. So I think that was his way of trying to break me out of that. How old were you then? I don't know, 15, 16. Okay, because you said you were still pretty small back then, right? You didn't I mean, have I was, your... I was small till I was 18 years old. I was yeah. like five foot six, seven at 18. So Did you get beat up or <laughs> well, I got, other way around? I, well, it was more like I got talked about a lot, you know. So I, whenever I got talked about a lot, I would run to my sisters or my mother. Uh, like like we go to school, my mother was a uh, a bus driver, yeah. I would sit there right next to my mother, and everybody was teasing me about it. You know, mm -hmm. because I never had any male friends, even in high school. And I stopped playing football, at, and I was in the ninth grade because I was, a, you know, I was so afraid of being around guys for some reason. I don't know why. You're afraid of being around guys, you right. said. What do you why, think? I don't know why. I, I just think because I think it's just more like I saw so much happen to my mother back then. From and your I dad? Think, yeah, from my, whoever that guy was. <laughs> Who that guy was that was doing that? I didn't think it was my dad. I think it was somebody else, a couple of guys. But um, I really didn't know who the person was was doing that to my mother. But it's more like it, I think that's more of a reflection of me being close to her. Mm. So yeah, she was more the person that like, you would call a real parent, like a real parent. But yeah, vice versa. How you would want to look at that parent, mother, or somewhat of a mother, or. or adult figure yeah but uh, she was more uh, attracted to because she was the, the most gotcha you so you thought something was going to happen to you as well right. so that's how you associated like male figures right yeah is that switched off like is that something that you still subconsciously have those feelings about or is there uh, a certain point where that shifted well it, it shifted when i got when i got in the nba yeah it shifted, it shifted a lot i think when you grew when you grow up in a project, I think you really, really get a sense of value of like, wow, this this is my life. Yeah, this is the rest of my life. I'm gonna live like this the rest of my life, or am I gonna have to, you know, suck it up and do something different? But like, a lot of people understand when you're living in the project or even living in the slums and stuff like that, you really don't have any sense of direction. Yeah, you just can't go and say I'm gonna go to college and be a doctor or I'm gonna go and work for IBM or Apple or Google. Back then, Apple or Google didn't last. I mean, it wasn't around. Yeah, yeah. Well, Apple was, I think. Or like Google IBM wasn't. Was. <laughs> so Apple Definitely was not. was just starting out. But back then, you just can't just, you know, I'm gonna walk out of here and go work at this company. No, you had to go out there and steal. You had to do this, had to do that. It was all the negative stuff that you, that you was getting into a lot. Yeah. And uh, so basically, we really was, I really didn't see too many white people till I was like, until mm, I was like mid teens. Mid teens. Mid teens. I think about 15, 16, that's when I started to be around white people. You know, because that's when my mother transferred us to a white, all white school. Yeah. And, and I started to like white girls for some reason. You liked white girls? For since some then. reason, since then. It was yeah. Since then, I started to like white girls because the black girls didn't treat me well back then. <laughs> so it's the same thing about guys back then. Mm. You know, so I really couldn't, I didn't have too many girls that really liked me back then in the projects. And um, and once we transferred to a white school in Dallas, I was yeah. way across town. I started to like white girls for some reason. I don't know why. Huh. You mean white girls? White girls. White girls, yeah, yeah. Right. How long did it take you to see a first Asian? First Asian? Yeah. I'm not the first one, obviously. Oh, Kim really? Jong-un yeah. was first. Well, no, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> he had to know Kim Jong-un. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's amazing. Um, as you put, as you say something like that, you know, every time I go to Canada, there's a lot of fucking Asians, a lot of Asians there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. where do they come from? How did they go to they Canada? All get, they all get shipped all there. Of all places, Canada. <laughs> you know, Canada, Vancouver, Quebec. Yeah, you know, they call it Hancouver. Like, you know, the, uh, what they call it, Canucks and <laughs> stuff like that in Ottawa. Yeah, you know, I'm saying, why is all the Asians reside there? 
There's a lot of Asians in LA too, I guess. But well, yeah, yeah, we, we like the weather. It's, it's the weather here, right? The weather here, man. Yeah. The weather here, but in Canada? Mm. Canada's mm. a lot. I don't it's, know what it is. It is a lot, though, seriously. Yeah. D- different cultures, right? Maybe it's cheaper. I don't know. But, um, I mean, <laughs> let's try to get back <laughs> on track. You try to get here. back on track. You do my Asian, right? <laughs> yeah, you try to distract me here. Um, so, I mean, you were like homeless at, when you were a teenager. You were growing up in the projects, right. mid teens, until you saw a first like, white person. You started hanging out with the first white person. What do you think you would have done if you weren't in the NBA? If you didn't discover basketball as your main vehicle? Basketball was like more like a fluke. Yeah. It was more like a fluke. When I started to grow, when I was 19, 20 years old, I started to actually start to grow up. Um, I started to get into basketball. Yeah. I started to go out to the gyms every day and play at the rec center and stuff like that. All my friends in the neighborhood. Um, that's probably when I started to really get into being with a, bu- with a, with a bunch of guys. Mm. Probably when I was 17, 18, I started to really hang out with a bunch of guys and stuff like that. Yeah. And then once I, once I uh, turned 19, when I was, I was growing, I started to play basketball a lot. And uh, I said when I was 20 years old, I was like, Six foot three, six foot four, and um, it is, it's like I said, it, that's that's more like a fluke. The basketball was more a fluke. I just, it just happened just out the blue. Why? Why do you say it's a fluke though? Because I never was interested in basketball, like ever. I never liked basketball because you play football when I you were younger. Foot, I played football. I love football because you know, living in Texas, you love the Cowboys. Yeah, the Dallas Cowboys. So, yeah, so I love the, the Cowboys. Football. I love to go, go out there, and, you know. You know, Roger Starbucks, Drew Pearson, you know, Tony Doris said, yeah, th- those old school guys. So every Sunday, I didn't want to go to church. I wanted to watch football. Oh, damn. So pretty much. But that, other than that, I didn't, I didn't watch basketball at all to like to probably until 1979, 80. Wow. And so, how, how did you first talk about the first time you really discovered basketball? You just saw someone playing, you just joined in, or how did it happen? Uh, my sister, my sister played basketball. They was all American in high school, four year old Americans. Uh, they I followed them the whole time when they was they was playing basketball in high school. So, um, I really got into got into it with them, but I never really played with them. It was mm. more like I was more like a supporter, like a more of a cheerleader. <laughs> Speaking of you know, yeah. while I ride with the pom pom thing, wow! I just wanted to cheer them on and stuff like that. So, Did you dress that, up and stuff too. I didn't dress up, okay. but I was more I was more like that. So you don't. Yeah, go go go! That type of guy. Yeah, but um, yeah, I just got into basketball then. But I think I think the the biggest push for me when my sister said then is you know you're growing right once you start playing basketball, mm. and they didn't know how to play basketball. I just knew how to play football. So you know, I was when I started to grow, I started to go to the gym with them and started to play basketball. And I just I just picked it up. Yeah, I picked it up real quick. Is it true that you grew a foot? A year. whole foot in one year. That's, that's the truth. Holy shit! I went from six, six five, seven, and six, seven, with six, eight, something like that. Like a, probably a year and three or four months, but it just grew. I'm just growing the whole time. <clears throat> and your body obviously isn't used to it. Your brain's not used to it. Well, it's not used to it, but I'm saying, but when your body, if, if you grow like right away like that, like in, say three or four months, yeah, I think you, I think your body will have a problem. I think mine's more like a, a progressive. Because like the you know because I was so athletic, right? I was so athletic, so basically I was just growing with my body, and uh, the more I was playing basketball, I was growing in my body. I was playing basketball, so I was like six foot one dunking, uh, six foot four dunking. So basically, my body was growing with my whole uh, my progression. Gotcha, gotcha. Was your dad tall? No, I think he was like six foot maybe. Six foot, and then your mom mom was I guess a little shorter than that. Five, 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 six. Okay, so yeah, it really was a fluke. Six, seven. If yep. your parents were six foot and five, seven, that's not. Oh yeah. That's not like normal. Uh, well, I mean, I think it's, it's a lot of families around the world. I mean, you know, we got a lot of Asian families got tall kids, and they're probably like yay tall, right? That's true. Uh, uh, they do some surgery or something like, like that. Yeah, like, you don't know what goes down in China or something. <laughs> China, Tokyo, Hong Kong, places like that. Okay, yeah, you never know. <laughs> so, but I'm, I mean, so, but you see, you see a lot of athletes. And our athletes that play basketball, their mom's not tall. Yeah, they're you not. Know, it's just amazing. Mom's like fucking five, 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 six, maybe five, seven. Yep. You know, yep. most most uh, you know, athletes' moms, shit, for some of the reason. They it's get it weird. From, they get it from their dad, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So I doubt it, but I think it's one of those things where you just, 
for me, it's, I think it's more luck. More, yeah. luck, more luck of the fact that, wow, my sister was six foot three, my other sister was six foot two in high school. Yeah. And I was five foot seven, the shortest one in the group. And yeah. So, and all of a sudden, I became the tallest one in, in two or three years after. Gotcha. And uh, became the most famous, <laughs> the most famous of the three. So, I didn't expect that. You know, going from being homeless, going from playing, you know, concrete basketball to college to to where I am today. It's like, damn. Yeah, homeless, <laughs> cheerleader. So, I mean, you're basically Five-time NBA champion. I don't I mean, think that's you name, you the regular name story. In the like, God damn. God, crazy. I, 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 can't, I can't sit there and imagine, you know, living in the streets, um, living in the streets to being homeless and da-da-da-da and going to jail so many times. Just How many imagine. times do you think? A lot. A lot. Can you count yeah. more than more than ten? I think I've been I think I've been in jail more being famous than I have not been famous. <laughs> I think I you know at my house uh, in uh, Newport Beach. I think I went to jail sixty seventy times for what? Like just just for the hell of just, it. Just I mean, for, just 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 because I was doing wild parties. <laughs> yeah, much, I wasn't killing nobody. I wasn't you know hurting. No, nobody. no, I, I was just, not. just just going to jail because they want they wanted me to go. You know, go to the jail for like three or four hours, see if the party stop. Yeah. And they didn't realize every time they took me to jail, more people came over. <laughs> so, so, okay, great. So, basically, they just stopped. But, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, if, if you're looking for that 30 for 30, I think it, it'll tell you a lot about how if you can see the pain that I, that the, the way I talk, the pain comes out. Yeah. The pain comes out of my mother. The pain comes out of my sister. I think the, the, the one person in that, in that, 30 for 30 that really was more calm and then she kind of broke down is my daughter. Alexis? Alexis. Oh, man. I mean, she probably was more calm than anybody that hold, to hold us 30 for 30. She looked pretty special. calm. She was calm and then, she, uh, then I think at the last segment, she, I think she broke down. Which segment? Wh- which part? I think at the end of the um, 30 for 30 when they asked her about me and stuff like that. And it's like, it's, it's like, my lifestyle between being a nobody to who I am today, it's, fucking, it's insane because if you take that lifestyle from beginning to end, it's like being a rock star from being, beginning to end. Yeah. You take a rock star before he became a rock star, she or he or she became a rock star. Very simple, you know, very maybe diverse, but more as you progress into your craft, all of a sudden you, get, you, you become, you, you get into all these different ventures in your life. Yeah. And I think I'm just, I'm just one of those guys that pretty much got into so, so many different venues, so many different avenues, so many different genres, so many different you know, nationalities, everything that has happened in the world I got into. But for me, for, for me of all people, I, I survived it. I'm surviving it. Yeah. And a lot, of, a lot of entertainers, a lot of rock stars and stuff like that, we talking about them, but they're not here no more. Mm. So it's very difficult for people to really, for me to sit there and talk about it because you have to really live it to see yep. it, you know. So and you see like a lot of documentaries on rock stars, movie stars, entertainers, basketball athletes, and stuff like that. It's amazing how their lives have trans uh, are so parallel, are yep. so parallel. But it's like. You know, you don't have to make a story about Dennis Rodman. All you gotta do is look it up. <laughs> I de- I've done it. It's too many. St- <laughs> too many stories. To too count. many stories to count. So, yeah. and but to, to live through it, yeah. to live through it, and still living through it today, and and more like my ventures are still going. Yeah, I'm still going. So, um, it's just like this uh, one man show I got going on right now that's coming up. I mean, living through it. it this. Obviously, we have to go back to this close call that you had that's infamous now about you in your truck, pickup truck. This is when you were in the NBA. You I was had, in Detroit, right? You were in, yeah, I believe you were in Detroit. Right. You are in the NBA, right. making millions. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't even fathom this having that kind of lifestyle when you were growing up in the projects. And here you are. You have the shotgun in your pickup truck. Oh, yeah. What think, was going I think, through I think, your I think mind? everybody knew about that. Everybody knows, yeah. What was but, going through your mind? But then? the people don't understand. I wasn't making millions. <laughs> so I was just, I was, in, NBA, I, yeah. I was in the NBA, but I wasn't making millions like right. they're doing today. Um, I just, it's, it's more like you know, 
it was, it was a very difficult time at, at the, um, in 19, I think in 1991, 92. Very difficult time. That's when I left uh, the projects and went to Oklahoma, to, to, to um, Southeastern Oklahoma State, yeah. and lived with that white family. And uh, it was just more like it was a big transition for me to go from there to there. And, and plus having a, a new baby, uh, somewhat of a wife, <laughs> you want to call her that. Uh, Who was that at that time? S- someone of a, of a wife. Um, okay. I had a new baby. Yeah. Um, that's when Alexis was born. And uh, a lot of things started to unravel after that when I started to be, tried to be a f- family man, which I didn't know how to be. And um, I think once a lot of those things started to unravel, my wife left me, took my baby, wrecked my house. The team started unraveled. Guys start to get traded, people start to get fired and stuff like that. Everything started to just unravel around me, mm. and I know how to handle that, you know. And I was like, "Oh shit, I'm back in the projects again." That's how you <laughs> so, felt like. So, I felt like I'm back in the damn projects. Shit, I'm all alone again, you know. Back in where I started, and I was I was to be in the NBA to be like whatever, a, 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 a NBA player and be happy, have money and stuff like that. But then all of a sudden things start to just devour and just disintegrate. And I just like felt like you know, there was nothing nothing, nothing else for me to, to live for at that particular time. So I just got the truck, went to, the, to Auburn Hills. And like I said, it was just some other reason there was a gun in my car. It was already there? <laughs> it was already there because I, cause I lived in Oklahoma for like, Four years. We, okay. we went hunting a lot. And oh, I forgot gotcha. that me, me and my people that I live with, we had guns in our car as a gun rack. It was like two guns there. Huh. And stuff like that. I kept, forgot, kept forgetting I, kept, I had them there. And then I looked back there. I looked, I said, oh, shit. And I, and I grabbed one. And uh, I put it in my hand in the front seat. And I just started to contemplate. L- literally right there. You know. Didn't know if it was loaded or not. I didn't check if it was loaded. I, I figured it was loaded, but I didn't check if it was loaded. But and I just started to contemplate, and I just kept looking at the uh, Auburn Hills, the palace, and I kept thinking back, thinking back, my wife and kids, Oklahoma projects, growing up. I just kept thinking about those things. Yeah. What's is it worth it? I kept saying, is it worth it? Well, was worth it. You know, living me, me living and and me at this particular moment. Was it all worth it for me to be right here where I am today? Literally, is, is it worth me being here? Right. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's a cliche. All of a sudden, I, um, I turned uh, the radio on, and uh, I had a CD in, and I think you probably heard this too, and Pro Jam was playing. <laughs> Pro Jam was playing. That song came on, Release Me, da 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 that song came on. And I started yeah. to listen to that song. It was more like I just, it was more like I just kept listening to it, listening to it. And and all I heard was probably, I don't know if it's minutes, hours, or whatever. All I heard was people knocking on the windows, people beating on the doors, stuff like that. I woke up, like, and I kept saying, am I dead? <laughs> am I dead? Because I thought I shot myself. Well, you, you fell asleep or something? I fell asleep. I Shit. fell asleep, but I thought I was dead. I thought I was dreaming when I woke up. I said. That you were in heaven? I, I don't know where I was, but I thought, I, thought, I thought I was like, what the fuck? You know? Because not, my last thought was to 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 be on on that if if I did this would things change? Yeah. And I just for some reason I fell asleep and luckily I didn't shoot myself. And you didn't talk to anyone. You didn't give out signs. This is actually what I've heard. My my uncle committed suicide ten years ago in Korea, mm-hmm. and I've heard that the people that actually are the ones that reach out for some kind of help, they either post on Instagram or they call someone and tell them how depressed they are or any of that. Those are the people that are still not ready to commit suicide or kill themselves. The people that are put a smiling on the face, you have no idea whether they're actually happy or sad, or what they're going through. Those are the people that tend to be the most dangerous because they're so committed to just ending whatever they have that, right. that they don't moment. need anyone's approval. They don't right. need any external factors. They just are going to go out and do it. Right. So it sounds like if you didn't reach out for help, you were serious, like you were. You were thinking about, about killing yourself. Yeah, you know, even even after, even after that, I kept thinking about it. I kept thinking about it. Even when I went to San Antonio, I thought about it <clears throat> because I kept saying, "I've done everything. I won championships. 
And then I started to make money. <clears throat> I said, I got that. And I said, what is, what's left for me to do? <clears throat> I mean, I was really contemplating the same thing about, wow, man, <clears throat> you know, just what is my life? What is my purpose now? I've done everything. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, for some other reason, somebody called, reached out to me and said, Dennis, I need to do something with your hair. And I said, I right, agree. So that was an avenue right there. But, you know, like you said, a lot of people don't call out for help because it just happens just out the blue. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I see it a lot today. I think back then, back then, when people uh, committed suicide, it wasn't as as rapid it is today. <laughs> it was back then. It it's wasn't back then. because back then, it's, stunt now. Yeah, it's, 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 like more, it's more of a publicity stunt now. Yeah. It's like, okay, great, I'm going to kill myself. Great, cool. But it's like, shit, and the shit ain't funny. You know? <laughs> so it's like, but... Uh, it's like kids. Um, it's like kids today. If you want to get some attention, you go shoot up the the high school <laughs> for yeah. publicity, right? Yeah. And it's kind of fucking nuts. But but for me, I do know the suicide tendency was was a very uh, very rampant in my in my life for, for I say for no one even I never told this before probably for like three or four years I never told nobody. But I think I think I think I shown signs of me growing weaker as far as like being a human being yeah i think my friends knew how vulnerable i was certain times i would after certain games sometimes and he said then once you go in there by yourself and, and let it let it out mm. and i just go in a room by myself and i just sit there on the ground and still like why me why me blame me <clears throat> i always blame myself for being who i am today and stuff like that i think a, a few friends knew that i was on that on that cuff of just trying destroy myself and uh but uh it's it's funny to go through something like that something like that when you when you don't when you have the capability to help yourself yeah well if when people start to recognize and all of a sudden they try to help you but they don't try to push you mm. to really to get help it's more like okay great they try to comfort you first and try to make sure that you're okay first and that's for me i think that's all i needed was people say okay great it's okay we like you. We love you. And that was my biggest flaw right there. Which I, you know, because my mother never loved me. <clears throat> I never had a dad. <clears throat> my sister, they, who knows? My family left me. Team left me. Everyone left me. Try to commit suicide. Go to San Antonio. Didn't have no sense of direction. <clears throat> Tell everybody to fuck the world. Even though that uh, San Antonio was a Bible bumping s- state, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody went to church. I didn't, you know, I'm trying to reach over here to the devil and da da da. da. <laughs> so I'm trying to reach on the other side of hell. And it just, it just was four, three or four years I was going through that transition. Which direction am I going? You know, am I going to go on and stay on the good side or am I be on the bad side or I'm going to be just right in the middle? Mm. And have no, no guidance, no direction. So um, I think the. I lived in San Antonio and go to Chicago. I think Chicago helped me out a lot. It helped me out a lot to really get over that. In what way? And the fact that people actually liked me. Mm. They actually they liked me what I, what I was doing f- for them. And I love pleasing people. Right. I love pleasing people. You know, <clears throat> a lot of people said, damn, man, you don't care about the money. I said, nope. <clears throat> I said, I don't play. I, I never played the game for money. For right. the money. Never have. Right. I, I said in all my interviews, I never have played the game for money. You know, so... I think that uh, Chicago actually really liked me because I like to work, I like to go out there and have fun. And people start to embrace that. And I think that, that's pretty much putting me over the top as far as like, I got a purpose yeah. to, uh, to perform and to uh, entertain for people. And Chicago and, was really the time when you started <coughs> to become this vibrant character. This oh, is yeah. when you started dyeing your hair. You started you started dressing oh, in, yeah. in a different way. Oh, yeah. This is really when you started to find the real you. This is something that you've been well, somewhat the real me. Somewhat, somewhat the real me. <laughs> you, you okay. Trying to find some identity, right? You know? you know. So, but I, I think they say it takes you half your lifetime to figure out who you are. Half yeah. your lifetime. I, okay. I think half your lifetime. Say if you live like to eighty, it probably take you to like forty or fifty to realize who you really are. Mm. And I think that today's world, I think a lot of, a lot of people have a tendency to think they know who they are at 14, 15 years old, which they don't really know who they are. No. And I think that's more of a vision what people are saying and all the fake news and all the fake ideals and all the fake admiration that you think you have. I think that, you know, for me, it was more like I was trying, when I had the gun in my hand in Detroit, I was trying to kill the 
old me so the new me can come out and be reboot again. That's pretty much what I was mm. pretty much doing. I think when I went to Chicago, I think that that old Dennis, that old Dennis over in Detroit, wasn't there no more. It, it, this is the new Dennis for some reason. It wasn't even a bad Dennis. It was more like a more of a fun Dennis, a more of like a exciting want to live Dennis. Mm. And um, and every day I, I just love just love living. I love uh, the excitement. I love the people. I love who I was. And I wasn't a follower anymore. I was yeah. trying to be more of a leader as far as like, as far as like just in general with people. And uh, it was just fun. It was just fun for those four years in Chicago. It was just so much fun. I felt, I felt so free. Right. At last. So I felt free because I didn't have to really go out there and try to <clears throat> prove to people that, hey, am I worth being here? Do I, am I worth for your love? Am I worth for your caring? Am I worth for your your, your uh, confirmation and say, okay, great, we like you. No, they just like me because of me. Right. And I, and I like that. And there's a positive feedback loop, right. right? Which is like, okay, I'm becoming more myself. I'm becoming more free. People right. like me. So you're going to even go above and beyond. I mean, there's a wedding dress trying to promote your book. Right? Everybody should look the up wedding, pictures the for that. Wedding dress, the wedding dress. Oh, God. <laughs> but it, it, was just, it was just so fun because when I was in Chicago, I had a couple of gay guys. Uh, a couple of... Um, Gay guys, used to, I used to hang out with every day. Yeah, I mean, literally every day. I had a couple of um, friends of mine. So they would look, dress me up every day, make up. We go do the drag shows and stuff like that. I would dress them in drag a lot, and a lot of people didn't they didn't pick it up till I think like the midway through the first season. Said, Dennis, do you do you know, uh, drag clubs a lot, gay clubs a lot? I said, Yep. And uh, yeah. some of my teammates, some of their wives was going to see if I was in these uh, drag shows. And they realized that that is him, huh? <laughs> and it's like, wow. They say, you actually do do it in drag. I said, yeah, I, I liked it. You didn't care what people I, other I didn't people care thought. what people said. But it, and then, and at that time, it was more like, damn. I, I, I used to think about when I was 13, 14 years old. And I yeah. was dressed up like this. And it was cool back then. And you're normal. It was, normal. It was normal, normal as you normal can get. But I said, damn, now I'm doing it again. And that, 36, 37 years old, and I just feel like, okay, great. People don't really look at me as this weirdo, this uh, this uh, gay, homosexual, transit, da da type of guy, not, and not as far as negative wise. Yeah. But back then, more and more as far as being an athlete, dressing like that, acting like that, people didn't know how to handle that. Mm. They thought that she was more like, it's cool, but. Wow! <laughs> wow! We go see if he going to come out and say if he's gay or not or not gay. But it's more like when people start to see me like that. If you see some of my book signings, I did in those three years I'm in Chicago. I was dressed in t- totally different, all makeup, all glammed out, and I was like, you know, pretty much uh, just more like RuPaul, but an athlete version. Yeah, yeah. I was more like RuPaul back before RuPaul. Right. right. <laughs> so it's stuff like that. So. Um, <clears throat> As you said, transit. I was I was a transit back then. Nobody even knew about it. And now, when you see a lot of old clips of, about me being in sports, that's a difference. Mm. Dressing like that, acting like that, being around stuff like that yeah. in sports then. Yeah. And pretty much, it wasn't accepted in sports then <laughs> because they didn't, they didn't know how to handle it then. You know, when you get when you got the commissioner of the NBA say, Dennis, you get more tattoos and more piercings, we're gonna kick you out the league. Really? Okay, great. There you go. I kept getting more piercings, more tattoos, and blah blah blah. They started accepting it. I love you it. You know, so it's more like I pushed the envelope, but it wasn't like more push the envelope to to endanger people. Yeah. It was more like, okay, great. This is fun. This is cool. It's not hurting nobody. Everybody's having a good time. And then all of a sudden, the NBA started to adjust to it. Mm. They say, "Oh shit, he's making a lot of money for us." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> money talks, right? He's making a lot of money for us. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. So whatever he does, we don't care. We just keep <laughs> doing what you're doing because they start to see people around the country, around the, the, the uh, United States, yeah. seeing kids come to the game with blue hair, tattoos, they're fake tattoos, with yeah. like tattoos, earrings, and stuff like that. It's, it's more like a cartoon character on the floor mm. having a good time with real life. It's entertainment. <laughs> Right there for real life, and uh, it was more entertainment. But I, uh, you know, I really didn't feed up that. I think more, I got so 
I got so enamored with it. Where I loved it. Mm. I loved it because I didn't try to go. I didn't try to prove to people that I'm, I'm trying to be different. It just, it just happened. It just happened naturally. Yeah, that was it. it. Just happened naturally. That they said, "Oh well, okay, this is me now. This is me. I love being my country with my own skin. Yeah, this is me. I love doing this now." And um, and, it's, and it's funny though how when I was dating girls, when I was in Chicago. Girls used to come and try to dress me up a lot. <laughs> And I'm, let me put this on you. Let me do this for you. Da, 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 da. Okay, great. Do it for me and stuff like that. So it's like, okay, great. Am I going to get laid now? No. No. <laughs> do they see you just as a friend? No, then, no it wasn't like that. It was okay, like, okay. But it, it was more like it, it, they, they wanted to see how far I would go with this. Uh, a lot of girls and stuff like that. When I go to uh, to bars and stuff like that, or even, even to a, a salon, they would try right. to do all this stuff to me. They try to do all this, put all this makeup, and all this, you know, do their hair, do all this, and stuff like that. So. So I didn't go as far as they wanted to go. Yeah, this is the big thing is, is, is I feel like you've just been misunderstood, mainly because you were just far ahead of your time. Right. And you talk about the NBA not really being able to understand the tattoos, the hair, yeah. and even the media. They just didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to deal you, with you, it. You were really the first person to be able to perform at that level athletically <laughs> and to be this pop, the Madonna of the NBA, as they call it. And I think they just, when someone don't, when they don't know how to kind of put you into this, peg hole or to put a title on you <laughs> no they're just going to talk oftentimes a lot of shit about you a lot of shit but i think then i think it was more like it, it would have been different if i didn't win championships yeah for it sure been, it would have been different <laughs> see there's a lot of scenarios right there it's yeah. like if i was doing those things and i wasn't winning anything i was just trying to get recognition and stuff like that i think they probably would have kicked me out the league right i mean right. If, you, if you look at a scenario i think it was like it was about five, six years ago. I think the first guy to come out, I think it's from Cleveland Cavaliers, he came out and said he was gay. And they basically told him to get get out. Wow. <laughs> get out the league. And he pretty much left the league. I think, do you know about this? No, you don't know about this. I think if I know the football basketball player, he's from Cle Cleveland Cavaliers. Okay. He said that he was actually gay and people looked at him like, wait a minute. That's it. That's it right there. He lived in Miami. And uh, he was walking around um, pretty much in uh, West, uh, West L.A. Yeah. So it's like more yeah. like in Hollywood over there. And uh, he used to go to Abbey. I used, I used to see him all the time with Abbey with his, with his lover, boyfriend or whatever. Yeah. I never judged him. I said, hey, man, you all right? You, everything's cool? And I think the NBA didn't, didn't know how to handle that. Mm. Even still today, yeah. you don't see athletes coming out. And that's a you know a lot of athletes yeah, know, out, there's a lot of athletes out, yeah. out there swinging quick. <laughs> so it's just like, you know, they just they just, they're afraid to come out. But I, I think it was a soccer player just came out. Yeah. Over in Europe. I think a soccer player fun, I mean really full blown say he's straight gay. Mm. I think, you know, even the football guys won't say it. Mm. Guys won't say it in football. Football is is a very masculine sport also. It, do, do, it doesn't really matter though. I mean, even in basketball, I mean, it, doesn't, yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I mean, yeah. it's just amazing so it's like people would accept people in certain genres oh she plays soccer she must be gay lesbian oh great that's acceptable oh she played basketball oh she must be she's definitely lesbian huh right. <laughs> so I'm just saying, but they accept that you know it's okay great it's like a lot of girls a lot of girls don't like to look at girls when they when they're nude at each other they don't like to look at each other unless they're you know they're gay or you know or they're yeah. lesbians but guys it's like funny though if, if you put if you put a bunch of gay guys in a um in a sauna or jacuzzi or something like that, people don't realize that gay guys are not like that. They don't, they're not like that. They're not flamboyant like that. Yeah. They'll talk to it, but even even in a locker room, if I knew that if it, if it was if it was a gay guy in my locker room, I wouldn't give a damn. Mm. I don't. I, I'm not playing because he's gay. I'm, I don't want to play because he, play with him because he's gay. And I said this comment. I said this comment quite a few times. I said, you know what? What would the NBA would have done if I would have said, if I would have said, wow, this is Chicago, the first championship. I would have told the world that, you know, just let everybody know that I've been, you know, I'm, I'm actually a gay. I wonder what, what they would have did then. Weren't a lot of people questioning that because yeah, you were they, defending the LGBT community? Oh, yeah. The people, were, people, was, people was asking questions, stuff like that. But the deal is, though, and it's so funny, the fact that I was so flamboyant in all the clubs in the, in the gay community. I was so flamboyant. I was out there. I mean, I was out there at the gay parades and every goddamn thing. I was out there being the leader of the pack yeah. and stuff like that. But it's, it's more like 
they knew I wasn't gay, but they didn't realize that I was actually representing something that was very cool for the for the for the community and for the world. The fact that it's okay yeah. to be d- different, it's okay to do certain. This it's it's uh it's out the box. It's okay, and I think the gay community really accepted me like that. And I just like I do a lot of uh, photo shoots like that in old drag and, and gay attire yeah. and stuff like that. I didn't care because it's like want to okay great. If I if I can do this and and, and be, be accepted accepted, why not? Right, and I was just I, I was just wondering. I asked somebody, I asked uh, this uh, executive one time. I said, "What would you think if I would have came out and said I was gay in 1996? Would you guys still would have had me on the team?" This in Chicago. He said, "You know what, Dennis? Yeah." I said, "I know that. I know that <laughs> because they had people. The NBA had people looking, looking, spying on me." Spine on Spine you. Spine on me during the season because I was, like I said, I was in a lot of gay clubs a right. lot and stuff like that. They, they had it, people probably investigated spying on me to see that I was like indulging in the gay activities and stuff like that. And did you catch one one day? At no, the clubs? no, no, no. But it, it's not that I didn't catch them. Okay. I knew they was there. Uh. I knew I knew they was there and stuff like that because. It is so funny though how the NBA, how sports world, how commercialized things are today. How much the business people watch what you do, watch your every move, and for me, they watched everything. Mm. They watched everything I did. They, they went out, in Chicago. I went to the Baton. In go I went to the Abbey. I went over here. I went over this. Da, da, da. They knew where I was, stuff like that. And uh, and I, I was just, I was just kind of curious. What would the NBA and the sports world would have did? In the world, all sports, all sports fashion would would, would have did if I would have said I was gay back then, which I'm not gay. I'm say if I would have said I was gay, yeah, I think everybody in the world would accept it. You think so? Back then, you know, like I said, five six years ago, they didn't accept it. Still, st- still today even, in even basketball, now, they don't accept it. They don't accept it now. They don't accept it now. But I'm saying, it's. I think that I built that such of a tolerance as far as like. Hot, hot, what type of person I am as far as like people say oh shit he dressed weird he does this he does that but it's funny though you never hear people on TV say or even try to lash out and say but everyone want to know Dennis are you gay or not no one said that but they knew what I was doing mm. but I'm saying I think I would have got away with it back then just because one because I'm winning yeah. I'm a superstar and plus I'm not ashamed and people knew that It'd be different after I was hiding it, but I wasn't hiding it. Right. And uh, I think today's world, I think I think a lot of people are still afraid to, to really unveil who they really are. What's your advice to those people, the people that are still <coughs> not, not putting them, themselves out there? I just think it's, I think it's really sad, the fact that, and oh, I'm going to go back to this. I was saying, I was saying, as far as being 12, 13 years old, go back to that, I actually contemplated what's our gay was I gay back then? Because I never liked it being around men mm. back then. I think that's the reason why I think I was so acceptable to my sister making me up, putting dresses on me, putting wigs and stuff like that, going out in public and stuff like that. And then going into the NBA, and all of a sudden I'm going doing the same thing 30 years later. <laughs> so 20 years later, I was like, damn, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm liking it mm. and stuff like that. So, um, and, it, and it's, it's, it's ironic though. It's, it's ironic. I forgot what I was going to say, but that's, that's a good subject. But um, it's full circle, though. It's, it is. A, I think it was a full circle for me. Even today, I still she'll tell you. My wife will tell. You, I dress, still dress up in drag sometimes. <laughs> so I was. We always go to the Abbey and stuff like that. I, I like dressing up in drag. I love it. I love it stuff like that. You know. Yeah. But uh, it's 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 really weird though. I mean, society today. Yeah. I just wish a lot of people would come out and say they are gay. Let's see how people accept that. Right. I, want, I, want, I wish I wish some guys would come out and say that they're bisexual and stuff like that. But what's your advice to those people? Because obviously they're they're maybe they're not all the they didn't have the NBA championships like you did, where you, they were you were your superstar. So even if you did come out, maybe there wouldn't have been as much of a backlash because their priority is okay. Let's just get this guy to win the championship. So what if someone is just a regular old Joe listening here today? They're not an NBA player even. They're just a high school student or they're a university <clears> student. Well, you don't know, like pushing the button. I like pushing the button. I'm saying, you know, it'd be different if Tom Brady came out. Hey, I'm bisexual as hell. <laughs> what are people going to say to him? 
Well, you know, he had that he had that look. So what the hell? <laughs> so why would not, why not accept it? Right. <laughs> so it's like okay, great. He played twenty two years of the fucking NBA, uh, NFL. Yeah. Why not? So basically, he has a beautiful wife. So some 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 good about him. I think it could be accepted in certain 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 um, sports. Mm. Basketball, I say yes. It could be accepted in basketball. You think so? Baseball, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Soccer, yes. <laughs> Football. I can say yes, but that's my opinion. But but they'll say no. But those other sports, yes. Right, right. Yes, because you know you see soccer. They're like, you know, you know how they are. Soccer, you know, you, you barely hit them on 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 their, on their finger. They fucking they're a bitch, right? They just <laughs> <laughs> you think they shot their fucking mother, right? <laughs> they they sit there rolling around the ground. What is wrong with you? <laughs> Nothing. But I'm saying, but in soccer, you, you know, you, you probably can say yeah. It could be a little, you know, da da da. But like I said, I, I <laughs> would, I wouldn't care. Though. I wouldn't care if you what what gender you were in sports. I don't care because I don't pay you to be a certain way. I pay you to do one thing to win. Yeah, to win. That's what yeah. I pay you for. Just like in life, I pay you to do your job. It's like you say, if say, say how many executive, how many president, how many owners of any company are bisexual and gay. Right. A lot. Tim Cook, Apple. I mean, yeah. a lot. Yeah. A lot of them. Shit. I mean, shit. Yeah, does, yeah. does anyone say anything about them? No, nothing. But it's yeah. it's cool. But I'm just saying, it's sports is not cool. But I said life life has a lot of different gateways, in, you know, in life. So I just think that people need to realize the fact that quit quit looking at these this 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 one off fantasy world today. Right. One off fantasy world, what you see on Google, what you see on your iPhone, what you see here, it's like more like, oh, da, 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 this is great. The next fucking five minutes, oh, this is great. I mean, there's nothing really, it's, it's a facts or fictional today. Yeah. Life wise. Yeah. So, you know, so as far as sports, I think a lot of athletes have an identity, uh, identity uh, situation. You know, because <clears throat> they all want to be fashion icons. They all want to be, they all want to have tattoos. They all want to be different. They always want to have an opinion. Uh, they want all want to have money. They all want to have girls. I don't think wives, but girls and yeah. stuff like that. So it's more like okay, great. So it's nothing really changed in in sports pretty much. Right. You know, I just made it different back then. Now it's now it's like everyone is doing it. Yeah, you're saying as long as you get the job done, whether you're an athlete, no. whether you are an employee, right. whether you're a manager, it, it really doesn't matter. It, doesn't it seems matter. like when you were playing with Michael Jordan, right. Scottie Pittman. And, and Phil Knight, I mean, what was it? Phil Sorry. Jackson. Phil Jackson. <laughs> Phil Knight. Nike's still the same brand. <laughs> right. Same, 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 <laughs> same thing. Play, a lot yeah, of Phil's out there yeah, in the basketball yeah. world. Right. They don't care, right? They, they just wanted you to get just, the job I'm done. Just get the job done. Yeah. It's just like in, anything in life today, it, you know, they want to get the job done. But I think, I think of all athletes on the planet, I'm, I think I'm, I'm a special breed because people look at me different. Mm. You know, a lot of people can do a lot of things, what I've done. But it's like if I do it over here, people say, "Oh my God, he's back! He's back being crazy again. He's back doing this. He's back doing that." Right. But these guys doing the same thing I'm doing. They get in more, the worst. Tro- they get in their troubles way way worse than mine. But why am I always the one being left out of anything? Mm. What do you mean left out? It means more like okay, great. So it's say like let me see if I can use the example. Say, um, I can say I'm, I'm just gonna name somebody. Say you're LeBron James, yeah, and <clears throat> I'm Dennis Rodman, and this company want to want you to do a Q and A with the company so I get motivation speech. Who would you want? Who would you want to do that motivation speech Q and A? Everybody's gonna say LeBron James. Hmm. Uh, say if you want. Dennis Rodman to go do a, uh, uh, say, emotional type of vibe for this company. Who would you want to have, Michael Jordan or Dennis Rodman? Dennis Rodman. Right. Dennis, you want Dennis Rodman for that one? Yeah. <laughs> for that emotional shit. Without, yeah, but without for the emotional shit right there, because people just, people don't know me for being emotional a lot about my life. Yeah. But I'm saying, but what would you what would you rather have as far as like? If you want someone to tell the world about the world as a sports figure, who would you rather want? LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Phil Jackson, da da da. You name it. You name our twenty-five athletes. Yeah. Who would you want the world to believe? 
when they talk. I mean, just, I'm just saying, just, just put it in your mind. If you want someone to, to tell the truth, to, to, I'd, tell I'd, the truth, pick the truth I'd pick you. To, to tell the truth about the world. I mean, and, and yeah. no sugar and stuff like that. Yeah. Because, you know, when, when people, when athletes talk today, they don't really talk like athletes. They talk like they're, they're like wind up toys. Okay, you got to say it this way. You got to say it this way. You got to yeah. say it that way. You got to do it this way, which is nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Which is nothing wrong with that, but I'm saying though, at least put a little more passion into it as far as like what you want to uh, uh, put across. Yeah, put put across stuff like that. So it's like, you know, if you if if you want if you want to say, um, if you if you playing sports, that's your life. That's your life. That's your life dream. Play sports, right? You want to win, win, win. Yeah, stuff like that. If you want to have a family, you want to have a family. But for me, it's more like I want to have everything to be normal and cool but i always want to have a heart behind it i want to have a heart behind it a real heart yeah you know and stuff like that so and that's that's what i respect most about you you just don't have a filter i mean if if someone at your caliber came in just even today as an example they probably would have had like five six different pr people just to make sure we don't ask certain questions, that you don't say certain <laughs> things, you say it in a certain way. Wait, you just keep me casual with Misty here. Hey, well, Misty right there. She, she got she got the, well, you know, they're going to ask them four or five questions to make sure they don't ask them about North Korea. <laughs> Speaking of. Which way you could say. <laughs> okay, you ask. You ask. I feel you like I'm ask. obliged because I was well, in South Korea. You can, you can ask. I was in South Korea. I was with, um, I was with um, President Moon last year. No way. Yeah, and uh, I think you probably know they don't like him too much. Uh, my family was just visiting in, in Vancouver, and they're protesting right now. I know yeah, they don't like him too much. They don't like him too much. Very controversial they're stuff. Like, oh my god! Because he let that guy come over, Kim Jong Un come over at one time, and his sister, and stuff like that. But I think that he's actually pretty cool. I were mean, you a consultant I mean, I, or something? I, I, I just, I just think you know, even with that North Korea, as you want to ask about it, I think, I think with the Korean people, I mean, if you really ask. Take say here in LA, downtown LA, Korean town, right? Yeah. Chinatown and stuff like that. You go downtown and ask Korean people would they want to go back to Korea? They'll say no. Yeah. They'll say no. I'm like, I can just they can justify it though. They they live through it. But if you ask people would you ask people would they want to go to North Korea? A lot of people say yeah. Just to see. Just mm. to actually see it. Just, just as an experience. Yes, an experience. They actually, they actually say, "Yeah, I'll go." Just, just for for experience. Well, but obviously, there's a lot of controversy here. Right. So, I mean, I guess I'll start with this. Like, what do you think is the most misunderstood thing about North Korea or Kim Jong Un, based on what you've, what you're seeing on the media, at least how they're portraying North Korea and Kim Jong, based on the first experience <coughs> that you've had. I think I think the mis, uh, misunderstanding about Kim Jong Un. I think the fact that people don't realize that Kim Jong Un didn't build that uh, regime. He didn't build that regime. His dad died what four or five years ago. Yeah. What four or five years ago? He didn't build it to his dad. He just took it over. Mm. He just took it over. He just just you know he just like just following the lead. I mean, he just following his father's footsteps. And I think that if you look at him, if if you look at him, what he's doing. And, I mean, today's world, all you hear is bad things about them. Yeah. That's all you hear is bad things. What North Korea is doing this, North Korea is doing that, da 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 All right, great. Okay, cool. I didn't see it. But but, but he's actually changing his culture. He's actually changing the culture over there. He's actually changing a lot of stuff over there as far as, like, how they're living. And they keep saying it, but he's starving the people. He's doing this. He's doing that, which I didn't see that. Right. But um, – it probably is happening, but a lot of countries like that. But I think it's mis- misconce- misconstrued the fact that they say he is this tyrant, this this tyrant, you know. But like I said, I don't have eyes back of my head twenty four seven. But what I saw, he was very gentle, very cool, <clears throat> very understanding. We had a, we had a blast with each other every time we go, every time I go over there. Yeah, and did you guys uh, party together. Oh, uh, we uh, we did that. <laughs> we did that. Talk, talk sure. about the parties. Oh, we did that. We we had a we had a good time. Yeah, you know you know we have like eighty ninety people there. Well, well we had a good time playing playing that one game, this shot game, this vodka game, and we have these vodka bottles about this high. It's about like fifty bottles of vodka around the table. Is it like North <laughs> Korean vodka? Oh, or? whatever. I had my, I had ramen vodka. I took my vodka over there, okay. and we drank that for like a day. <laughs> and then we had tequila one day. We had this other stuff one day. 
but they like to have fun too. What you know, and they own a little wave. But it's like, but when they do it, it's like, ooh, Russian roulette. <laughs> it's like they, they you, have a good all, time. Can you all drink him, Jung Un? No, he really don't. He, really, he, he you know, he he likes to uh, and dabble a little bit, but he don't really get like sloppy crazy blah, 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 blah. but he, he does do his little cocktails stuff like the martinis yeah but um uh, but it's, it's 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 funny how it's funny how people perceive that guy as this tyrant and i and i actually say this to a couple of people and i actually believe this if kim jong-un said which he said it to me a lot he said he said if kim jong-un went on tv and said i would love to visit the united states I've said this to people. I said, if that kid comes over here to the United States, he'll be the most famous person on the planet Earth. Isn't he already but one I've of the most? Said, I've just said that people would people would look at him like, wow, that's actually him. Right. They want to think about killing this guy. They were like, wow, that's actually him. You know. You're saying like, people would embrace him. They here? would embrace him, man. I mean, wow. wow. They would embrace him. People don't. People think I'm stupid, crazy. I said, Yeah, you would. You embrace that little guy right there because say, like, How does that little guy right there have that much power in the world? You that- think he just like woke up and because <laughs> of the fact that his grandpa, of course, right. had the first regime. Oh yeah. And then his dad. You think he just like woke up one day and like his, when his father passed. He's like shit. Like now, I have to. Like, do you think he doesn't even want to? Like, do you think he just wants I, I, to? I don't think he wants to. I really, to me, I don't think he wants to. His brother. They said he killed his brother. His or sister his uncle did. Was something. Was open, and um, his sister, she, she's just there. I mean, she's she's pretty pretty much in the regime, but she's like whatever. But I'm saying, but then all of a sudden, he's the young one. He says, "Okay, great, you take it." And uh, that's how I saw. I look at it because he. To me, when when I see him smiling and talking about the, when he was a kid in Switzerland and stuff like that, yeah. it's like this this guy, this little kid didn't want to be this this person. He didn't even grow up in North Korea. He, like he never grew up in North Korea, so it's okay, great. You go come out one day, thirty two years old, and you go lead, lead lead this country that people hate. Yeah, and you gotta sit there and you can't go to America, and you can't go to other countries and da 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 da. So it's like, okay, would well, you want this job? I probably would have said no. <laughs> if I was him, I would say, oh, hell, I don't want this shit. You think he just wants to be accepted? I think I think in time, I keep saying in time, he's going to be accepted around the world just because. Because I look at look at, look at at the history books. Look at the history books. We still talking about fucking Hitler, and everybody liked that fucker. We talking about these, all these other fucking Julius Caesar. We still like that motherfucker, right? We still like that guy. That guy was fucking nuts, right? Well, I don't know if anyone likes Hitler. <laughs> I mean. I'm just saying, but I'm saying, but it's like, it's like that, 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 it's just that, that word Hitler, Hitler, not what he believed in, but it's like, wow, Hitler, that motherfucker, that, 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 it's more like, ooh, okay, great. More of a, a, a figure. Yeah. And, 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 and leadership around the world. You know, it's like, and like a Julius Caesar, you know, right. C- Caesar. He was gay as hell. He, he was, was gay? Re- he was really gay. <laughs> he was really gay. Okay. You didn't know that? I didn't know that. You didn't know that? Look at your history yeah. books. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I'm just saying, but either one said, all the leaders in the world, all the past leaders in the world, like 200 years ago, all the leaders in the world, you put them all together right there. Yeah. Put them all together. We always talk about them. Right. We make moves about them. Right. We make moves about these people. And we sit there and we, we don't worship them. We're just more like, Wow. That guy was cool back then. That guy was awesome back then. That guy was mm. this and this. And we, we write stories. We still write books about these people. You and think so, that's why Kim Jong-un relates to you and, and, and treats you as, as his friend is because you both I don't know why Kim Jong-un you like my ass. Well, why do you <laughs> think all people, him? really. Yeah. Talk tattoos. I, I rebel against every goddamn thing in the world. Wow. I like Dennis Rodman because he's a fucking asshole. No, I don't think it's like that. No, I don't think I think, I think it's the fact that... I think he relates to me as, as far as like an independent individual, right. independent, that I don't let anyone try to uh, make me do things I don't want to do. I think that's one of the reasons why I think he likes me. But I think that he likes me because I do care about people. He cares about people. And and I, I'd want the world to know on your podcast. And I want everyone to know that the history, history in the world. When Donald Trump went to the summit in Singapore, right? Yeah. I was there. In Singapore, what did Donald Trump say before when he got out the car before he, before he met Kim Jong Un? What did he say when he got out the car? I don't know. What's the first thing he said? Donald Trump said when he got out the car. 
Anyone know? When he, when he walked in, he idea. said, I can tell if I like this guy in 60 seconds. I can tell. That's the first thing that came out of his mouth. He said, I can tell if I like this guy in 60 seconds. Yeah. I'll let you guys know. And? I'm just saying, you look it up. Watch this. Look it up. Took him four and a half, five fucking hours for him to say, hey, I like this fucking guy. This guy's awesome, man. This guy's cool as hell. <laughs> four or five hours to say that. You don't think he just had to say I'll that because he's way. trying to Why keep a good relationship? Head, dude. He took him four or five hours to say, oh, I like this guy. This guy's cool. And then when you saw him inside shaking his hand, Kim Jong Un wasn't smiling. Donald Trump was smiling like a motherfucker. <laughs> so Donald, Trump, Donald Trump was like, Fuck, oh, oh, I like this guy. This guy's awesome. He's, you know, Kim got that face. So it's like, all right, da, 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 da. <laughs> I was just laughing. I said, Donald, that's the way he is, and stuff like that. And every time he meets the guy, he keeps saying he likes him. Right. He likes the guy. I keep saying you like him. He also him. says he likes Putin, uh, Putin, and and all these other. Oh, Putin and all know, those Putin guys. All I, I, just, I, I did something in uh, Russia with Putin. Putin's a fucking crazy. He, he's a crazy ass motherfucker. When I was over at Putin one time, he was doing like he was doing like a fashion show. I was with him. He had like fucking 15, 20 fucking girls with him, models, right? Jesus Christ. And Putin had this fucking Lamborghini to ship in this fucking hotel. This is a true story, guys. <laughs> I just left that all of a sudden. I well, go to this uh, fashion show. God, all these girls just sitting there, beautiful fucking models, Russian models. I mean, God damn. It was like, you thought you was at this fucking mafia convention. <laughs> Everybody was out there, wow. It probably was, actually, if he's there. It was, I don't know what it but it was like more like you had uh, the village people playing, you had the uh, all these other bands playing. They shipped all these bands from America over there to play this this uh, like this like party. Yeah. And I was like, I had a blast with him for two days. He just invited you? He invited me over there. I had, I was, he was cool to me. God damn. He was cool to me over there, you know, how shit is. But like I said, President Moon, same thing. I mean, it's a very controversial thing for you to do. I mean, you just don't give a fuck, I I, guess. I I, I just don't care, man. I mean, I put it this. Unless you you talk to people, unless you actually talk to people, man, and actually get from from their mouths and stuff like that. Yeah. And people keep saying about North Korea, you know, about the missile. Uh, I'll tell you a story. When when, uh, North Korea shot a missile over Guam's, but it was over Guam, right? Yeah, a couple years ago. I I think it was a couple years ago. I think it was like 100 miles from Guam. Yeah. And uh, I was actually in Guam. I was actually going to Guam. Damn. So I went to Guam, went to the airport. Hundreds and hundreds of people meeting me at the airport. Oh, my God. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for coming over to save us. I said, what are they talking about? Oh, this I mean, is before this, or right after. This, right you didn't after. know. I didn't know that that, that happened. And he said, Dennis, do you, realize, you know what happened? I said, no. He said, well, you know, North Korea shot a missile over Guam. And they just barely missed Guam. I said, really? And I just came back from North Korea. I just came back from North Korea a couple weeks before that. And I'm like, really? You actually think he did that on purpose? I'm like, okay, whatever. So I go there. So I go to hotels. Everybody in the hotel is like on their knees. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Now we're saved. I'm like, I go to a Luha over there. And they start the whole damn Luha. We want to thank Mr. Robert for coming over to saving Guam. I'm like, oh, my gosh, stop. No, it's not like that. So what are you guys doing? And uh, but I think I think I think they said that because Kim Jong Un said on that on on a Korean TV, he told the people there. And I was sitting right there with him. He said, "Dennis, no matter where you are in the world, you are always gonna be safe." It's he just ironic that. that he did that right after you left North I, Korea. I though, he, but he said that I couldn't believe he said that. Like, is he actually really talking about me? And people say, yeah, he said that on the news. I said, oh, shit. All right, great. He gave me the key to North Korea. I said, all right, great. But I don't really support that because it's more like I got a lot of things I can say about Kim Jong-un and the things that he wants me to say to America, especially to the president. They don't want to hear from me, so I don't say shit. Right. I don't say nothing. So I keep it to myself and stuff like that. And I wish Donald Trump would open the gates up so I can go back because they keep asking me every every month. Are you coming back? Are you coming back? I said, I can't because Donald Trump won't let me. He won't let you? He won't. Well, he, he, he shut the door as far as going to North Korea. No way. So he's, he has to open the door again. So that's two years I've been over there. Two and a half years. Wow. I want to go back. What would you do next time you go back? What would you say ki- to him? I'm going to take my kids. Alexis, Trinity, and DJ? All of them. Take all the water. What would you say to him? No, they want to go over there and hang out with me. 
Yeah. I want my daughter to play soccer with, with, the, with the North Korean team. I want my son to play basketball, <coughs> basketball with the basketball team over there. Come on, have a, I want them to experience it. Right. And show the world the fact that, hey, it's not that bad over here. Wow. Not that, not that bad. We're just talking about North Korean North currency Korea, here. Yeah. Um, he, you're right. saying he's the guy that right. we should really blame. Well, and I, don't think, I don't think you should blame him. I just, I just think the fact that since we're in the 21st century, yeah. I think for twenty first century, I think that you can't take you can't uh, take back time what hap- happened back then. I think the fact that you know, uh, it's, I think what's happening in Hong Kong, in, you know, Hong Kong and Tokyo, yeah, you know, so it's basically that's what's going on there. I think the fact that <clears throat> I think the young the young youth of Hong Kong and China and stuff like that, what's going on? I think they they realizing the fact that wait a minute, we're uh, probably tired of this the old same regime. They want to now. They all of a sudden they got a mine now in Hong Kong and right. in China and stuff like that. So I think that's what's happening over there right now. Mm. I think they said, okay, great. They've been in power for so many generations and centuries and stuff like that. Now it's time to go in the twenty first century. You know, understand what's going on in really in the world today. Yeah. <clears throat> so if you look at Hong Kong, what's going on with Hong Kong? It's crazy. It's, it's crazy, crazy over stuff, there, right? Man. Yeah. It's, it's crazy stuff over there. Crazy stuff. I think that plus I think all the people are trying to voice their opinion about the new. What they want is for us to be free and da 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 da, so they want to do certain things. Yeah. But it's like, who, who's going to solve that? Mm. It's crazy. Who's, who's going to solve that? You know, it's more like if you, if anyone asks you about your uh, your, not, your nationality and, and your background, what would you tell people about Korea, Korean people? I mean, I have very positive things to say. And if I'm just, <clears throat> can you yeah. say that you're more of an American Korean? I would say so, yeah. American Korean, yeah. But, you, but you don't know anything about your culture, right? I mean, I was born there, but right. yeah, I'm definitely more Western than right. I am like a Korean, South Korean. Right. Yeah, I want to be careful not just generalize Korean. Oh, no. I mean, just people don't even know that there's a North Korea and South Korea, you know, most places. A lot of people don't even know They don't that. even know. They, they, think, they think, oh, Korea, oh, shit, okay, great. What about Kim Jong-un? He's not from Korea. He's from North Korea. Right, <laughs> so, right. so it's like, okay, great. Were you like the New Mexico or old one? It's two yeah. of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> old Mexico, New Mexico. Yeah, but I, I just think that when you, when you like say when you when you generalize people in the world, you better be, just be careful because people do have sensitive sensitive, sensitive vibes about bullshit. Yeah. It's like you, if I said, okay, great, goddamn fuck Korean, so they ain't worth the shit. I'm like, I can't say that because they're not. I like them. Right. I like everybody. I like everybody in the world. You know, yeah. I want everybody in the world to get along. But I think that <clears throat> a lot of people have their opinions saying that you know they're rushed to judge. Yeah, the rust, the rust is just about anything. Yeah, <clears throat> so I think that um, people need to really understand life. Life is a really difficult place to live right now. Yeah, it's very difficult. You know, yeah. er- everyone can't make money. Everyone, everyone can't sit there and try to be the king of the hill. You know, everyone's, everyone's. Um, you know, it's, it's funny how people got. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> they got so many damn ideals on the phone. You know, talk, talk about that. Okay, so hold that up. So you don't have a you don't have a smartphone. This, I don't have a This phone. is your phone. What is this from? Nokia or something no, like that. I have no clue. Nokia. I have no clue. So to say. what what's the reason for having for not having a smartphone? Is this just something you're like a Warren Buffett type? <laughs> you just don't like technology, or well, are they tracking you? Well, that's a good one too. Well, they do track me. Do they? Well, North Korea when I when I. Uh, they do track me, whatever they got to say. But I said more like, it's not me for saying anything bad because I'm, I'm saying stuff right here. Yeah. But it's more like what I say to the... To the leader. To, to, the, to, to um, Kim Jong-un. To, to, to Donald Trump and stuff like that. Oh, okay. If I talk to the FBI, people, stuff like that. So, but other than that, yeah, that's why I like this because it's simple. It's easy. I hate texting. Yeah. Why do you text? I don't know. But I hate texting. I like going ahead and in and send. It's cheap. It costs me 30 bucks a month. So I don't need the Giga 4. What they call it? Giga 4? You think it's 6 or what they call it? G6 or whatever it's called. My, my kids want an i10, I mean, i11 Pro, what they call it. They, they want the new i. The I got a Huawei, so I mean, right, I got, yeah, the, I'll, the big I'll admit it, I got a Huawei. Right, so it's like <laughs> this is good, man. I got four of these phones. I got two over there sitting over there. So yeah. I like these things here. They're cheap. They're so good. You, so you don't, you can't Instagram on that, I guess. No um, Candy Crush, no Angry Birds. Well, I, I can do a picture. You think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty accurate picture. Pretty, pretty accurate picture. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but it's it been cool talking to you. But anyway, for one of my ventures, what I'm doing now. Yeah, yeah. Talk about that. Talk about that. All the stuff I'm doing now. So thank you guys for listening to uh, 
you know, Dennis Growth Rodman, minds. yeah, whatever. Growth, <laughs> Growth mind. So it's all good. But anyway, what I'm doing these days <clears throat> that's coming up pretty soon, probably next month or so. You probably see my one man show that's uh, produced by Mike, uh, Mike Tyson and and Kiki Tyson, uh, the, the Tyson Ranch, the family. And uh, so, me and Mike Tyson, we have collabed together to do all this stuff, CBD, <clears throat> all the oils, and, uh, lotions, and stuff like that, drops. So. We're doing other ventures. We're doing Tyson Hotels, uh, Tyson Ranch Hotels. Uh, I'm venturing on doing my own thing, my podcast. Uh, What's your podcast called? Uh, right now, we're talking about uh, um, Undisputed. Okay. Undisputed. Okay. So uh, that's Mike Tyson. He's called his Undisputed, but I'm calling my Undisputed Rebound or something like that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so there's a lot of things I got com- coming up right in the next, say, four or five weeks. But uh, like I always tell you guys, I'm 58 and still going strong, brother. Love is in the air, baby. Love is always in the air, no matter where you're in the world. Check it out, baby. Appreciate life, you, man. Life is a good thing, man. Got good kids right here, man. Got good kids interviewing me right now. <laughs> Got good kids. All different genres right now. <laughs> Very Korean, multicultural here. American, black, white, Mexican. Mexican. <laughs> where are you from? Philippines. Philippines. Oh, we got oh my God. My, she, God. my, my, my wife was yeah. No way. And, wow. And, and uh sad thing about it, you know, see if we can top top this story. Since yeah. she's from the Philippines, it's amazing. My father from the Philippines. Well, he lives in, in the Army, Philippines right now, right? But he was in the Philippines. So he had how many wives do you have? Sixteen, seventeen? Seventeen wives in the Philippines, twenty nine children. And it's funny though. They kicked him out of the Philippines because of that. Because he had too many wives? Because you can pay for the goddamn child support. <laughs> God, he's, the, he's the modern day Ganga. I know. <laughs> Ganga Khan, whatever his name is. I don't know, man. They, 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 kicked him, they kicked him out of the he, he could pay for the child support. And so it's like, great. They all of a sudden, when he, when, he, when he got kicked out of the Philippines, he tried to be smart and cute. He tried to be smart and cute. Oh, I'm going to go to Chicago and see my son. Asking really? for money. <laughs> asking for money. Fucking, for money. Yes. For money. So he did that whole thing. He came to Chicago. And it's funny. So that's the last story I'm telling you guys. Yeah. So he came to Chicago. I was going to practice. And I was trying to get in the gate. So I was late, like five minutes late. So this black guy runs up to the truck. So I let the window down. He said, I said, yeah, what, what do you want? I'm late for practice. He said, dude, I got, I got, uh, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your father. I was like. Look, I said, come on, man. I said, this is, this is, this is, this is, I'm your father. Star Wars? Dennis. I'm like, this is funny. He says, I'm, saying, Dennis, he said, I'm your father. I said, yeah. he said, I'm not lying. I'm your fucking father. I said, dude, I, I'm late for practice, man. Just get up away from my truck. Man. I'll talk to you later. So I go in So I go in at, uh, the facility, go practice for like an hour. Then we had a game that night. So we're playing the game. It's the third quarter. So all of a sudden, we look up my team. I say, Dennis, look up there. I look up, up there in the third, in the third deck. And stuff like that. And all the cameras, ESPN, everybody's up there interviewed this, whoever was up there. It was, it was a big, lot, large crowd. He said, "That's you know, that's your dad up there." He said, "I said, my, my who, my dad." He said, "Yeah, that's your father." He said, mm, "What's the deal?" He said, "Did you know that he had a, a number one, number one best-selling book about you?" I like, what? used your name. He used my name. So they paid him a million dollars for this you know, this best-selling book that he wrote about me, and this guy don't know anything about me. What he read in the newspapers. This is what happened to Rihanna's father, and Rihanna sued him. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. The same, the same shit. I can't sue the guy. He ain't got no money. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't got no money. Pay my child support. Like shit. 29 <laughs> you know, child your daughter took about 25. I'm just saying. Imagine 29 kids, man. I'm, I'm the first one. 29 kids running around America. Oh running Amer- around America. How many you think they, kids they got? Jesus. How many Christ. kids they, they kids got? Finding the Rodmans. Finding the Rodmans. <laughs> <laughs> isn't it isn't it ironic though? After all that, right. you, you decided to marry uh, a Filipino. How do you know she? How do you, she just told me one day. Said, you didn't know. I didn't know. I don't really didn't even know she was Philippine for like recently. But what? How long? I I, I know. Yeah, like, Sakapuna. Sakapuna. Yeah. You guys recently got married? Uh, I don't know when we get married. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Oh, very public place. But she's, how Explosive about that? Guys. <laughs> how about that? And she's Philippines. I really didn't actually know because she used to work for me 20 years ago uh, at my restaurant. And then we did, we got back together four years ago. I just didn't know she was Philippines. She said, well, you know, Philippines. You don't look Filipino at all. Yeah. <laughs> I told no. her she don't look at, at all, Not right? at all. <laughs> I don't know what she's American. American. Yeah. 
You're not full though. No, you're not full. You're not full. Yeah, that's why. Wow. Are you gonna introduce, are you gonna introduce her to your to your father? <laughs> so, do we know? Uh, this is something in common now. I know, right? We got something in common right now, right? Wherever he's at, right? I don't know if she's in Chicago or not. I don't know where he's at oh, right you know, now. You don't keep in touch. I, I, I think I think he's still in Chicago. Gotcha, gotcha. Right, so yeah, man. So anytime you want me back on here, man, just Appreciate let me know. You. So as a matter of fact, when I do my uh, one man show on um, with Tyson, you should come on, man. I love to, man. Come I on, just have really a good time, El Segundo. He owns a gun? No, no, El, El Segundo. That's where we at. Oh, El Segundo. <laughs> he owns a gun. El Segundo that? down here. So, <laughs> so we down there. So doing the, doing the podcast over there. So. I definitely love to come on, man. Appreciate you. Cool, guys. All right, guys. Let's end on a positive note. All right. Appreciate you, Dennis, for being on. Right. Check us out on Growth Minds, guys. There you go. Cool. All right. Let's get a quick photo.